Tonight, seven years after declaring it, BC falls further behind a rampaging public health emergency. We're not only dealing with the death, but we're dealing with, you know, the guilt of, uh, did we do enough, we didn't do enough. The deepening destruction of drug overdoses. MPs grill the Prime Minister's top aide about reports of electoral interference. It's been five months, it's been repeatedly asked, could you please answer? A new Canadian star on his art, his new award, and his mom. I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for her yeah. and her sacrifices and what she's done for me in my career, you know? Um, my conversation with Lamar Johnson. This is The National with Asha Tomlinson. A grim anniversary in British Columbia, especially for drug users and their loved ones. Seven years ago today, the province declared the devastation of overdose deaths a public health emergency. That was in response to data from 2015, nearly 530 deaths. Things have only gotten more dire. That number in 2022, nearly 2,300. Over four times more fatalities. After all this time, the questions burn hot. Is enough being done? Why are people dying at an accelerating rate? Renee Filipponi with some who know the tragedy intimately. You can take the protective cap off. It's a skill paramedics want more British Columbians to learn, how to administer the life-saving drug naloxone when someone is overdosing. It's staggering to see the elevation and the amount of overdoses that we're seeing still. And it's record numbers. In one day alone, in March, the BC Ambulance Service received 205 overdose calls. It's now averaging 120 calls a day. At first it was just fentanyl that was on the street, but now we're seeing the fentanyl and it's mixed with a variety of other substances. Often making it much more toxic. My son had seven overdoses in the last year before he passed, before he finally passed away. He was my partner. He was, you know, Alex Deblotny says his 36-year-old son, Curtis, struggled with mental health issues. He self-medicated with illicit drugs, which killed him this past December. So we're not only dealing with the death, but we're dealing with, you know, the guilt of, did we do enough, we didn't do enough? Tablotny says the government is only taking half measures. He wants testing strips for toxic drugs more readily available. Our loved ones and those who struggle. Rallies were held across the province today with grieving families sharing their stories. It's a group that just keeps getting bigger every year. Your child is more likely to die from fentanyl than falling off his bike. Many here calling for more access to safe drugs now, including Jennifer Howard, whose son died of an overdose. It's evident as we see people continue to die that we are lacking the services they need, and that's why we need a safe regulated supply. That sentiment echoed by drug users on Vancouver's downtown east side, where the community marks another year of this public health crisis. It's disheartening and it's hard because I walk down the street on a daily basis and I see people hunched over and you know you can't tell if they're alive or dead. So Renee, how is the province responding to this? Well Asha, BC acknowledges that this serious problem is only getting worse. The government's budget included a billion dollars for mental health and addiction, much of which will go to scaling up detox and recovery services. And to help destigmatize drug use, it's also decriminalized the possession of small amounts. But advocates really stress that safe supply issue. Right now, it's available to about 4,000 people. The coroner and provincial health officer want it expanded, but that will need sign-off from Ottawa. Asha? Renee Filipponi, thank you. You're welcome. The Prime Minister's Chief of Staff was grilled by MPs today about what Justin Trudeau knew when, when it comes to China's attempts to interfere in Canada's elections. It was a meeting the opposition has pushed for. Rafi Bujikanian with what came out of it. Opposition MPs had been waiting for this for months, a chance to question the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff about foreign election interference. But the question after question, mostly cold water. I can't, unfortunately, speak to specifics. Being able to figure out what you can and can't say publicly is not something that I should be sitting here doing. I can't get into what the Prime Minister has or has not been briefed on in terms of uh, specifics of intelligence. Um, 
It's, uh, it's frustrating, I know, <laughs> uh, for me as well. Katie Telford's appearance comes after multiple Global News and Globe and Mail reports citing unnamed intelligence sources saying Beijing's diplomats in Canada meddled in the last two federal elections, allegedly trying to sink conservative candidates and favor a minority liberal government. When did the Prime Minister become aware of Beijing's election interference in the 2019 election? Just the date, please. It's been five months. It's been repeatedly asked. This has been an ongoing conversation over many months and years. Telford was clearer on this point. Of course, the Prime Minister reads any documents he does receive. More details came in the hours before the hearing started. The committee got a list it had been asking for, revealing national security officials have formally briefed the Prime Minister at least six times since October 2018 about foreign interference and his office twice. But no details on what specifically was discussed. The opposition says public trust is eroding. They want a public inquiry to be called. The Liberals have appointed a special rapporteur to make that decision. It's not clear what body is best to look at it given the sensitive nature of the information. And Rafi, we know the deadline for that decision is next month. In the meantime, though, the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation is making headlines again tonight, right? Yeah, Asha, this is about the $140,000 donation the charity accepted from two businessmen linked to the Chinese government. That money's finally been returned, but now the Conservatives are asking for the Canada Revenue Agency to audit the foundation with a particular focus on that donation. Meanwhile, the foundation itself has written a letter saying it welcomes an investigation by Canada's Auditor General and they're looking into this on their own as well. All right. Thanks, Rafi. Tonight, the U.S. national security community faces stark questions after a 21-year-old man accused of leaking highly sensitive secrets appeared in court. Chris Reyes has what the case reveals about the accused and the U.S. government's own policies around classified data. It's a beautiful day. It's gorgeous. The family of Jack Teixeira, avoiding all questions as they walked into a Boston courtroom, where a judge told the 21-year-old suspect he could face up to 15 years in jail, charged with leaking dozens of documents, including sensitive military information related to the war in Ukraine. Faced with that gravity, Teixeira and his father exchanged I love yous. From other corners, more anger and concern than words of support. If, in fact, sources have, and methods have been compromised, that could translate into dead Ukrainians that didn't need to be dead because we didn't get the process uh, and, and the protection of that information. It points to a problem that's endemic in our national security uh, structure in Washington, D.C. It's too easy to get access to this stuff. According to court documents, Teixeira has had top secret security clearance since 2021 and access to other highly classified programs all because of his job working in cyber defense operations. The more people you have involved in maintaining the systems, uh, you know, the more you're spreading around the information. But uh, hopefully this will be a wake-up call. The U.S. Department of Defense now assessing the damage of the leaks and how it hands out security access. Teixeira allegedly shared the documents online to a chat group of mostly young men and teens talking about guns and video games. While the FBI has not released a motive, one security analyst has a theory. This individual well, seems to have wanted to uh, basically have a bit of a leadership role and seems to have been using uh, this classified information as a way of perhaps establishing authority and, you know, perhaps even stoking his own ego. In court, Teixeira said very little. He didn't enter a plea and softly said yes when asked if he understood the charges. He remains in custody until his court appearance next week. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. A U.S. lower court ruling that could take an abortion pill out of the hands of millions of women has been put on hold. The U.S. Supreme Court is allowing federal rules for mifepristone to stand for now. The drug is used in about half of the abortions in the U.S., but this week an appellate court put additional rules on access. The Supreme Court could make a decision on the Justice Department's appeal as early as next week. Here at home, Canada's spring housing market is open for business, but the latest numbers show homes are selling for less compared to the same time last year. 
in March, the average price of Canadian homes from standalones to apartments was down 13.7% compared to March of 2022, fetching an average of $686,000. Anis Hedari gives us the big picture on the new data. Selection is more limited lately when looking at homes. There's fewer listings than your average sort of spring busy real estate market um, uh, in, in a regular market would, would bring. We've just had to broaden sort of the neighborhoods that we're interested in looking at. That feeling that there are fewer listings is backed up by data. The latest national real estate numbers showing 20 year lows in the amount of new listings. People don't want to put their houses on the market necessarily when the market is low. So inventory levels are really low and they continue to be low. Supply is low. Sellers stay home when prices drop. The average price of a Canadian home sold in March, more than $686,000. That number is higher than the month before, but a big tumble from last year. Parts of Ontario seeing big drops from 2022 prices, down 15% in the GTA, more than 23% in Windsor-Essex. While there have been big price drops in Ontario, here in Calgary, the average home price went down just a little more than 1% compared to this time last year. But even spots with relatively stable prices have fewer listings these days. There's increased population, but no increase in supply, so prices don't fall. People are still coming to town, so we're still getting that same rate of interest, but we're no inventory, so that's why prices have stabilized. With the Bank of Canada holding off on interest rate hikes for now, the real estate industry is hoping Canadians hop back into the market. We're going to see by mid-year to the third quarter, we're going to see more stability and more balanced market. Right now, we're heading back into certain sectors, into a, a seller's market. But with mortgage interest higher than it was last year, that seller's market may not be any more affordable for buyers. Anis Hedari, CBC News, Calgary. Ontario's gaming regulators proposing an end to an increasingly common sight. Celebrities and star athletes in ads for online gambling. As Ithil Musa explains, the fear is they are especially good at pulling in young gamblers, vulnerable to addiction. Advertisements for online gambling are everywhere. Billboards, stadiums, even public transit. And the commercials are just as slick. With every tap, a new legend is born. Often featured are top athletes and big Hollywood names. And that's what the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario is proposing to change. Banning sports stars and celebs in ads for online gaming to reduce their appeal to kids. Especially when it comes to uh, celebrities who are admired by uh, younger people. Um, because that's encouraging them to gamble at an age when they are still vulnerable. According to the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, a third of Ontario students in grades 7 through 12 surveyed in 2019 reported gambling. I definitely think there should be limitations. The AGCO is also considering banning gambling companies from using cartoon figures and social media influencers that could entice youth. Go, rise. But the Canadian Gaming Association, an industry group, says it doesn't see anything wrong with the people in these types of ads. So they don't speak about gambling. They don't encourage people to gamble. Last April, the UK banned celebrities from appearing in gambling ads. And this week, Premier League clubs agreed to stop featuring gambling companies on the front of jerseys by the end of 2026. This 25-year-old teacher in Markham, Ontario, says while she enjoys betting online, she does worry about her students who are underage. Seeing them gambling at a young age, is, it definitely rises or raises some red flags for sure. Some experts want even stricter regulations on sports betting advertising that mirrors the rules followed by the tobacco industry to better protect children. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. The parents of the U.S. journalists facing espionage-related charges in Russia are speaking out. Be optimistic. Believe in happy, happy ending. That's uh, where we stand right now. But I am not stupid. I understand what's involved, but that's what I choose to believe. 
The full interview, a Wall Street Journal exclusive, is available on its website. Evan Gershkovich was arrested last month for allegedly spying on a Russian defense company. This week, the U.S. declared it a case of wrongful detention. Imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny is reportedly in critical condition tonight. He's been suffering from severe stomach pain. As Breyer Stewart explains, his supporters claim it's another attempt by the Kremlin to silence him. This was Alexei Navalny wailing after being poisoned with a Soviet nerve agent more than two and a half years ago. Now the Russian opposition leader is locked away in this prison and his supporters believe the Kremlin is trying to once again kill him. We uh, unfortunately at this time cannot rule out the possibility that he is being administered uh, small amounts of small doses of some kind of poison. Anna Veduta has known Navalny for 10 years and is vice president of his anti-corruption foundation. She says he has severe stomach pain and has lost 8 kilograms in just over two weeks. On April 7th, an ambulance was called to the prison, but he wasn't taken to the hospital. They want to, to make him regret. They want him to rot there. They want him to uh, get silenced. Kremlin officials claim they aren't monitoring his health. We're talking about a prisoner, about a person who's serving a sentence. It's a matter for the Federal Penitentiary Service. Navalny might be Russia's most high-profile political prisoner, but he's far from the only one. Navalny, just like my husband, is seen as a personal enemy of the state. Evgenia Karamurza's husband, Vladimir, is also a vocal opponent of the Russian government. He, too, is now in poor health in prison. Before he was jailed, he also survived suspected poisonings. I have no reason to believe that the Russian authorities will not try to do this because they already tried it twice in the past. Still, even in harsh conditions, the men continue to rail against Vladimir Putin's regime. But the fear is they are much easier targets now that they're imprisoned. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Turning to France now, after weeks of protests over unpopular pension reforms, a constitutional body says President Emmanuel Macron can go ahead with his plan. Susan Ormiston explains. Fight and fury on French streets failed to change the course of France pension law. The Constitutional Council in a final test cleared the way to raise the retirement age to 64 from 62. Protesters predicted this isn't the end, but they've run out of road and time to legally force a change. Hey, I'm shocked. We're living in a democracy, and it's not a democracy. Bravo. But it's a big win for President Emmanuel Macron, who says he'll enact the law within days. Touring renovations at Notre Dame this morning, he made it clear he had no intent to back down. <laughs> not giving up is my motto, he said. The huge protests since January and national strikes rattled the country and pilloried its president for challenging a sacred trust in France. Like many countries in France, people are getting old and we need, uh, we need uh, more and more uh, people in the labour market working to pay uh, pensions. Macron staked his political legacy on reforming pensions rather than run up the deficit more. You have to do something. Either you raise the legal age of uh, retirement, or you will lower pensions. Decades ago, former President François Mitterrand lowered the retirement age to 60, creating a culture of early exit. The idea that people could finally live, not be broken down by work, feel the strains of their labour and their jobs. Pushing it up first to 62, to... then 64, has collided with widespread discontent. There's a lot of wider anger, I think, around Emmanuel Macron and his presidency. This opposition to the retirement reform as part of a, a wider campaign of resistance against what people see as Macronism. Tonight, nervous tensions again in Paris. Macron has forced France into a new era, but it's cost him. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, London. Mask mandates have been dropped in most places across the country, and now you can add many healthcare facilities to that list. The risk to patients has dramatically changed over the last few years. 
why some say the timing is right and others aren't so sure. That's next. The diabetes drugs some say could cure cancer, even reverse aging. Let's talk about some additional benefits of metformin other than type 2 diabetes. We'll give the lofty online claims a reality check making the ice a little more accessible. We want to go skating, he comes with us easy. We don't leave him behind, uh, we can include him. One dad's DIY solution for his son. We're back in two. That is Spanish mountaineer Beatriz Flamini returning to the light today after 500 days of darkness, a possible new world record for longest time spent in a cave. Flamini documented her time exercising, reading, and making art. The European Space Agency has launched a spacecraft heading for Jupiter. One of the mission's goals is to explore the planet's ocean-bearing moons. It's expected to get there in eight years. COVID-19 mask mandates are lifting in hospitals and other healthcare facilities. But the move has some asking, why now? Christine Birak looks at the patchwork approach across the country. In some parts of the country, masking in healthcare settings is still mandatory, but in most provinces, it's not or won't be for long. While many welcome the shift, human rights groups are concerned and some are asking this question. Why do you feel like now is the appropriate time? BC's chief medical officer says mandatory masking in hospitals is being dropped based on COVID levels in the community. As we've come through the respiratory season, we, uh, we are seeing much less spread of virus. There's much less community illness. Quebec and Ontario are leaving masking rules up to individual hospitals. Dr. Alain Baisman is responsible for infection prevention and control at UHN, Canada's largest research hospital. Our primary objective is always to keep patients safe. He says masking will remain in all traditionally high-risk areas. Patients entering emergency rooms may still need to mask up, but fewer people may be wearing them in hospital lobbies, hallways and elevators. The risk to patients has dramatically changed over the last few years because of vaccination, because of previous infection, because of therapeutics. Patients are not as high risk of acquiring COVID and having bad outcomes with it as they were in the past. Data show since January, the number of COVID-19 deaths in Canada has been steadily decreasing. The virus killed 113 Canadians during the last week of March. Just need to grab a mask there, sir, you're good to go. PEI plans to drop mandatory masking next week, but health officials say they've helped. If we have a, a large outbreak of influenza or RSV or COVID in the future, as we get into the winter seasons, I think it would be quite reasonable to bring back uh, masking in hospitals in certain areas. And experts insist no one is saying Canadians shouldn't wear a mask when going into a hospital or other healthcare setting. They're only saying it's not mandatory. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Gillian Finley, co-host of The Fifth Estate, is leaving CBC News after more than 30 years. My name's Gillian Finley. I'm with The Fifth Estate at CBC Television. Okay. People have said heads should roll. Should heads roll? This is The Fifth Estate. Finley started her career as a reporter at CBC News in Vancouver. She went on to work at The Journal and The National, reporting on important stories all over the world. In 2004, she joined The Fifth Estate as a co-host. Since then, she's led dozens of important investigations. On Twitter today, Finley thanked the many over the years who trusted me to tell their stories. It was a privilege and an honor. Diabetes drugs like Ozempic are all over social media these days, hyped as miracle treatments for everything from weight loss to reversing aging. Metformin is getting a lot of attention in regards to its effect on aging and how it might be able to help us. Coming up, we're cutting through all the buzz about what these drugs can and can't do. Lamar Johnson. A huge night for a Canadian actor whose star is rising fast. For black and brown kids, you know, to be able to kind of watch this film, see themselves and be like, wow, you know what, like, I can do that. The dreams Lamar Johnson hopes to inspire in others. 
The National takes you deeper into the stories shaping our world. Next. Let's talk about some additional benefits of metformin other than type 2 diabetes mellitus. I wish I could say it was from diet and exercise. Um, it's not. It is from a shot called semaglutide. You've probably heard of it. Metformin is getting a lot of attention in regards to its effect on aging and how it might be able to help us. So do you take metformin? Let me know how it's going below. It's hard to miss on social media. A sense of excitement about drugs normally used to treat diabetes. Ozempic and metformin are being lauded as treatments for obesity and some are suggesting metformin could prevent cancer or even extend your life. So what's the truth? Joining us now are Dr. Sean Wharton, who specializes in bariatric medicine and diabetes treatment, and Tim Caulfield, a professor at the University of Alberta who specializes in legal and ethical issues in medicine. Good to see the both of you. Dr. Wharton, we'll start with you. To be transparent, we should say you were once a spokesperson for the company that makes Ozempic. What are these drugs supposed to be used for, and, and what is it about them that makes them useful for other purposes? So these drugs are type 2 diabetes drugs, but they, they, that, that means they work in the peripheral part of the body. So they go to the pancreas and to the gut, and they work there. But they also work in the brain. And the brain is what controls our eating behaviors. So if somebody is excessively eating or has excessive hunger or is trying to get the weight down, but they're not using their fat stores for their energy needs and they want to eat more, this dampens it and quiets it down so that you can actually um, use your fat stores for your energy and not eat extra food so you can lose weight. Okay, got it. Uh, uh, Tim, there's... A lot of hype, right, about these drugs and their off-label use. Is it overstated? Are they being marketed responsibly? Wow, there is an incredible amount uh, of hype about these drugs. And, you know, and I think it's fair to say that there is growing concern about how they're being used. Yeah, look, the off-label use is what's getting the headlines. And, of course, what we're talking about here is is weight loss. And the concern is that people are using this for kind of vanity weight loss, not for the clinical need uh, that the drug has been designed for. Um, and there is a lot of hype, not just uh, from coming from the manufacturers, but of course from the social media influencers too. And the message there, again, is often weight loss for kind of the wrong reasons. And, and as, as our medical expert will tell you, there are concerns with this drug. I have been hearing about those side effects and the long-term effects. Uh, Dr. Wharton, though, do you think there are ethical concerns with how the drugs are being marketed? Well, I'm not sure that there are concerns with the way that the pharmaceutical company is actually marketing it. It's more so a lot about the social media. So I did a lot of the research for the way that these medications work. Obesity is a real disease. If you're living with obesity, you've been looking for an answer to your, di your, your disease. And this is it. These medications are actually here. They actually work. It's a big deal. It's a breakthrough. Now, when it comes to using this for the aesthetic purposes, if you need to lose five pounds, this is not, as this has never been studied with someone with a low BMI and who needs to lose five pounds or get to a wedding. Not the people that we did the research in, not the indication for the actual drug. So I do have a big problem with it being used for a aesthetic purpose. It's off-label. It's not what it's approved in Canada for. It's approved for obesity treatment, and that's, that is a real illness. And Tim, what about those people who these drugs are intended for, people with diabetes, like Dr. Wharton is saying? What is the concern for them? Well, you've probably heard this. There's been headlines about this also. There's concern about supply, you know, about not being able to access the drug. Uh, there's also concern uh, that this drug is not being allocated in an appropriate manner. Uh, look, I even know anecdotally from my colleagues that are healthcare professionals, including my wife, uh, that patients are coming and asking for this all the time. It, the hype is just unbelievable. And so demand for this drug uh, is having a, an impact on the healthcare applications with, for which this drug was designed. Are you seeing that, Dr. Wharton? Uh, you know, what are you yeah. seeing in your practice with patients using these drugs and who want these drugs? Yeah, so my practice is specifically for people living with type 2 diabetes and living with obesity. Everybody that walks in the door 
is a candidate for this medication because they have the disease. Now, if it's being used in a aesthetic manner, I don't know where they're getting it from or how they're actually getting it because you can't prescribe it if the indication isn't actually there. So this hype is a lot of uh, American hype, but will it come to Canada? Po probably. And does it work? Yeah. If you want to lose 10 pounds, it does work. The drug doesn't care whether you're 450 pounds or you're 150 trying to get down to 140 pounds. But the question is, is should it be used in these people when there is, is a supply problem? And how are they getting it? And are there are side effects? And is the risk benefit worth it for somebody who wants to lose five pounds? Tim, when it comes to metformin, I mean, people are suggesting all kinds of benefits that sound really far-fetched. Cancer prevention, for one, you can get smarter, longer life. Is there truth to that? Well, it's a very interesting drug because there is real research that shows uh, interesting application. And by the way, it's a drug that's been around for decades, for mm -hmm. a very, very long time. Uh, again, being used to treat primarily type 2 diabetes. And again, that's where most of the clinical research resides. But there has been animal studies and worms and mice that suggest all these other other potential benefits. And what we're seeing is, is the, the longevity movement, which I think is almost like the new wellness woo movement that we're seeing. The tech bro industry is kind of really, really embracing this with the idea that you should be taking it when you're asymptomatic, sort of on a preventative, uh, for preventative reasons to increase your lifespan. And we just don't have good data to back that up yet. Look, interesting research is going on, but we don't have data to back that up. And by the way, I do think it's ironic that we have uh, the lowest life expectancy in the United States over, uh, since the last 25 years. Uh, meantime, all these billionaires are taking this drug to extend their life. I think it's, it's quite ironic. Something doesn't add up. <laughs> Dr. Wharton, what do you think about that and, and sort of Metformin has been around, but that people are now talking about it and talking about using it for other things. So the question is, is where did this research come from that goes beyond type 2 diabetes? It's epidemiological retrospective research that somehow shows that these patients tend to do better in terms of their longevity and their cancer risk. But it's confounded with a lot of different challenges. Um, the people who are taking metformin versus the other medications may have been a different group of patients. Uh, they, this is not data that tells us we should use it in a prospective manner in people who are looking to live longer or looking to deal with their cancer treatment. We need real research, the way Tim said, and there is real research that, that, that is going on. So we've been informed, there's some interest, it looks like it could be something, but we can't run out and start using it without actual data. Thanks for breaking it down for us. Dr. Wharton, Tim Caulfield, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The movie Brother dominated at the Canadian Screen Awards, winning 12 of 14 nominations, including Lamar Johnson for his performance in the film. Out of my own personal experiences were drawn in this film because, I mean, there's just so many parallels, you know? Up next, my red carpet interview with the young star about his surging success and deep connection to Canada. It's been a huge week with more to come Sunday as the Canadian Screen Awards continue. Long and important showcase for art films and directors. Some now say the CSAs need to take a wider view and recognize that fans want stars. Here's Eli Glasner. It's just been like a surreal dream come true. After a long hibernation, the Canadian Screen Awards are back in person with much to celebrate. You there! Why me, sir? Buzzy like films such as I Like Movies, Brother, and Infinity Pool are making waves. But take a look at the actors in competition. Big names in Canada's industry. But how many do you know? I would say in Canada, we're very big on the auteur, the director, writer, screenwriter. Canadian soap star Tanya Williams went from acting to founding a film festival. She says Canada is missing a critical part. You want your movie to be watched by as many people as possible. And those people are going to be drawn to actors that they've heard of. That is just the name of the game. Seeing how that responsibility now falls to the new CEO of the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television. It's my first year leading this organization into this wonderful week. I'm still smiling and uh, <laughs> it's all great. 
The CSAs are like Canada's Oscars and Emmys, all rolled into one. One of the week's biggest winners is the film Brother. I don't want you running the street with no hooligans, you hear me, Francis? For me, I would want to see all my colleagues who have worked tremendously hard, who have dedicated themselves, be, be recognized nationally, live. Man, action! But this year, the live broadcast gala has been replaced by a pre-packaged show on Sunday, hosted by Samantha B. on tape. The Canadian Screen Award goes to Lamar Johnson, brother. CSA winner Lamar Johnson has seen his star rise thanks to the American show, The Last of Us. Raised in Scarborough by his mom, an immigrant from Jamaica, brother gave him a role that reflected his own story. To be able to see yourself on screen is a big thing, you know. Uh, I remember when I was younger, I watched the commercial and I saw a little black kid that looked like me in that commercial, not necessarily knowing the seed that is subconsciously placed inside of me. The message from filmmakers, if we want to see our stories, we need help. If you love going to the movie theaters, then please, you got it, you got to go and you got to support. That's just, that's really the only way that we can keep this thing going. As the work to help Canadian stars shine a little brighter continues. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. You saw Lamar Johnson in Eli's story just now. Well, I caught up with him on the red carpet last night just after his big win. We talked about success, Canada, and what comes next. Hold it up, please. Yes. How's it feel? Wow. It's, uh, it's very heavy. <laughs> That's how it feels. But no, I mean, truly, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, um, this is my first award. This is my this first, is your first lead. Award? This is my first award, my first lead. Um, you know, uh, this is this is beautiful. You know, I've worked very hard to to get to this place yes. um, with myself and with my craft. Yeah. So, um, you know, yeah, I cherish this. Wow. I cherish this heavily. And when you were up on stage, what was that like? Take me through the moment. Um, I mean, I was a little nervous, you know, if I'm being honest, you know, because I, I mean, what I would, what I used to say, well, I, what I was saying today is, mm -hmm. I'm an actor, right? If there's, if I have to perform, I'm fine, right? Mm -hmm. Also, I started off as a dancer, so mm -hmm. anything on stage, performing-wise, mm -hmm. I'm cool with. Yeah. But now, public speaking is is a different thing, yeah. right? Um, so, you know, I just wanted to be intentional with my words and, um, you know, try and honor all of the beautiful people who who were a part of this. Mm -hmm. um, Speaking yeah. of all those beautiful people, yeah. I mean, 12 of the 14 award nominations here mm -hmm. at the Canadian Screen Awards yeah. went to Brother. Yeah. It's a Canadian Screen Award record. Yeah, wow. What do wow. you make of that? I mean, it's amazing. You know, I think specifically the fact that it is a Scarborough story, and yeah. I am from Scarborough. So am I. There we go. Scarberia. Scar Scarberia, <laughs> yeah. You know, we got to represent, you yes. know, and that's what it is. It's yeah. representation. Yeah. You know, we get to see ourselves on screen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I remember growing up, you know, um, I remember watching this commercial of this little black boy, you know, mm -hmm. and being like, hmm, you know, I could do that. Not really understanding, like, the subconscious seed that it planted inside of me. Michael. I'm Aisha. I know your brother, Francis. Everyone knows him. And I think this movie will do that, you know, for, for black and brown kids in Scarborough and yeah. really around the world, you know, to yeah. be able to kind of watch this film, see themselves and be like, wow, you know what, like, I can do that or, you know, I can be in these positions and I can be in these places. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's amazing. Talk to me, though, about the parallels, right, mm -hmm. with you and Clement Virgo yeah. and this film. Yeah. We're talking about the Jamaican-Canadian heritage, mm -hmm. being raised by a single mom, yeah. searching for that identity mm -hmm. as a black man yeah. in Canada. Yeah. Did you talk through that with Clement, and did you draw from those experiences in this role? Yeah, a lot of my own personal experiences were drawn in this film because, I mean, there's just so many parallels, you yeah. know? Being first-generation Canadian, um, uh, being from Scarborough, you know, being raised by a single mother, you know? Like, all these experiences I, I pulled from, you know, and kind of gave, um, gave those things to Michael, right? Obviously, the circumstances are very different, and, yeah. and his reality is different than mine, or was yeah. different than mine, but, you know, um, I was still able to tell an authentic story through him through myself. I truly saw myself in this character and yeah. I saw my younger self in a way. Um, and I, I, I just super grateful to, to have been chosen and, and been a part of this. Another theme for this movie is black masculinity. Yeah. And I mean, there are common stereotypes mm -hmm. out there about how black men should act. Yeah. 
unemotional, yep. tough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this movie, I mean, it challenges yeah, that. Yeah. And so what was that like sort of, you know, showing that vulnerability? And are you seeing that more in film and TV now? Yeah, I'm definitely seeing it a lot more now, you know, um, and people kind of challenging that masculinity kind of, yeah, this kind of stereotype, you know, where it has to, you have to be strong and, you know, you got to like not care and have no emotions and these things. It's yeah. like, but that's not human, yeah. right? Human beings, I mean, there's there's masculine and, and feminine in both men and women, yep. right? And it's just about, you know, um, you know, understanding yourself, being tapped into yourself, being in tune, and um, you know, taking advantage of those moments. You know, I think it's very strong to be tapped into your emotions and to be able to connect with those and be emotionally mature. You know, as opposed to you kind of suppress your emotions and just act off of like brute force. You know, that it's not healthy. There's that through line of, of yeah, like masculinity and, and what it's, what does it look like to, um, to identify, you know, as a black man in this world, in this circumstance, you know? I just want to talk about this hit HBO show. I think it's called <laughs> The Last of Us. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. play Henry. Yeah. What is it like to be a part of something so massive? Uh, that was, I mean, that was crazy. I mean, I was a fan of the game prior to me getting on the show. So the right. fact that I was a part of it, I was like, wow, like, this is amazing. And also the challenges that it came with. You know, I had to learn sign language uh, because Kevon, who plays Sam in the, in the series, is deaf in real life. So it was full immersion. You think they'll be okay? It's easier when you're a kid anyway. It was beautiful and I love to challenge myself because on the other side of a challenge is growth. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was able to grow through that experience and, and to work with Pedro and Bella and just to be a part of such a massive IP. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's just been doing so well. I mean, you know, when it was on television, it was still airing. I, it was like the number one show on television, you know, it was, yeah. it was massive. Um, so to be a part of something like that, um, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm grateful. I know you're a busy man, <laughs> but you did give a shout out to your mother. Yes, I want to thank my mother who's sitting in the front row. Without her sacrifice, I really wouldn't be standing here. So I really want to thank her dearly. And she is so important in your life. Yes. She is here right, right now. Here. I want She's to bring right her here. in. She is looking gorgeous. Oh. Hello. Thank you so much. What's your name? Sigail Johnson. And you know, I, mm -hmm. I'm now a mother of two boys. And that relationship, I mean, we're really close, as you can see. Yeah. Yeah. I a love mom's it. Boy. <laughs> I love it. What is it like seeing him on stage oh my tonight gosh, and knowing am, what you've gone, gone through to raise him? I am him. super, super proud, like, from all the struggles that I actually went through and, you know, just to make sure that I saw a talent from me was, like, three years old. Mm. And I made sure that I grew that, made sure I took him on set, I made sure I did everything for him just to make sure that he did well. And he succeeded. Him opportunity. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm super proud. I would I wouldn't be I wouldn't be sitting here if it, if it wasn't for her yeah. and her sacrifices and what she's done for me in my career, you know? Super um proud. I'm just yeah. I can't, I can't I couldn't I don't think I could ever repay her or thank her enough, mm -hmm. you know? But um it was worth it, yeah. Yeah. you know? Well, when you think about what he's yeah. holding right now. <laughs> yeah. We're all grown and everyone's doing well, so I'm happy. What know? a special moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, congrats to Thank you. Thank you so much. Congrats to you. Thank I you. can't wait to see what else is in store for you. Mm -hmm. Scarborough to the world. Yes, yeah, Scarborough <laughs> to the world, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. That's what parents who have disabled children live for, is that squeal of gooey. Coming up, an invention born out of a father's love for his son in our moment. Here you can see David Grimes of Ottawa sitting on his invention, the ice cube. The inspiration, a fatherly wish to see joy on the face of his son. Liam has difficulties with mobility and after trying multiple skating aids, David set to work building his own. Tonight, this inventive dad makes our moment. It's, you know, part of our great Canadian tradition. Don't want, to, don't want them to be left out. Well, we started off trying to skate with Liam, and he wanted to skate desperately when he was a toddler, but he, he couldn't keep his feet under him. There are so many skating aids out there. They're great, but not for Liam. So I thought, well, we gotta fix this problem. And you can set it up in two minutes. There's a keel in the middle so you can't cross your ankles. It can be customized in a lot of ways. And there's a bench too. So oh, we want to go skating. He comes with us. He's, we don't leave him behind. You know, we can include him. Hello, Liam. Hello. He just let out this squeal of glee and like I just cried. I might do it now. Yeah, yeah. and that's what 
that's what parents who have disabled children live for, is that squeal of glee. And that's what this is about. That is just so cool. It takes a brilliant mind and a real special love, right, to do something like that. Just so you know, people around town helped with the 3D printing to put it all together, and Liam and David hope to take it out outdoors eventually, too. That is the National for April 14th. I'm Asha Tomlinson. Have a good night.